Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now let us see how we use these methods to construct the phylogenetic trees. The first method which is also called as phenetics or distance based methods, it measures the pairwise distance or dissimilarity between two genes. The actual size of which depends on different definitions and constructs a tree totally from the resultant distance matrix. That means it transforms the sequence data into pairwise distances and then use their matrix during the tree building ignoring the characters. So it does not directly use the characters but based on the molecular sequences or the multiple sequence alignments it creates a matrix based on the pairwise distances and then use that matrix to construct the trees. The two methods broadly used under this are called as UPGMA that is unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean and ng method that is also called as neighbor joining the upga as i just mentioned it is unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean unweighted because all pairwise distances contribute equally means the uh, a and B taxons, for example, which are originating from a common ancestor or the node, they are equidistant. So the pairwise distances are equal. Pair group means groups are combined in pairs or dichotomous. Arithmetic means because pairwise distances to each group are mean distances to all members of that group. So based on these, it has been named as unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean. Now let us see how we construct the phylogenetic trees using UPGMA method. It is a simple agglomerative hierarchical clustering methods. Agglomerative means bottom to up. It has been developed by Sokal and Mishner in 1958. It's a simple approach to construct a rooted tree using distance matrix. Remember, it constructs a rooted tree based on the distance matrix. Though it is simple and very fast method, but it is not that reliable. Let us see how we construct the trees using this. There are certain steps. First, construct the distance matrix. Then, cluster the two shortest distance operational taxonomic units or OTUs into an internal node. Recalculate the distance matrix and then repeat the process until all UT OTUs are arranged in a single collect cluster. So the four basic steps is first you need to have the distance matrix, uh, join the two shortest distance OTUs into an internal node, then recalculate the distance matrix and keep on repeating this process. Now let us see with an example how it is being done. Now let us say this is the distance matrix based on the molecular sequences. There are five elements with following matrix D1 of pairwise distances between them. This is A, B, C, and D and E. These are the five sequences. And the distance between let's say A to A would be 0 obviously. A to B is 17, A to C is 21 and so on. So diagonally it will always be a 0 because A to A or B to B or C to C would be a zero distance kind of feature. Now in this matrix since the distance the smallest distance was 17 between A and B this is the smallest value so we will first join the elements A and B. So that means after constructing the distance matrix you need to join the two OTUs which are showing the minimum distance or the shortest distance value. Now let's say U denotes the nodes to which A and B are now connected. We are taking A and B, 
let's assume that u is the node through which they are connected. Now the distance between a and u or the distance between b and u is equal to the d1 value, the value of a and b distance divided by 2 to ensure the equidistance of a and b from u. So now let's say if the distance between a and b was 17, it has to be divided by 2 so that it shows that a and b are equidistance from u. So from u to a or b, distance will be 17 divided by 2 that is 8.5 as shown here. So this is how we have taken the first step after construction of distance matrix. We have taken that units or OTUs which are having the shortest distance and we have clustered them and predicted the distance from the common node or the common ancestor. The second step here is to recalculate the distance matrix. So this was the distance matrix we had initially. Now we'll make another matrix which we'll name as D2. How we'll update this with the new distances calculated by averaging distances between each elements of the first cluster. Now a and b are not separate they have made a cluster a b and then each of the remaining elements so let's say the in d2 distance between a b now which is acting as one cluster with c so a b with c let's say it's 21 and b here with c is showing 30 so a is distance with c b is distance with c divided by 2 that is coming out to be let's say 25.5 here. Similarly, the distance of AB with D. So A's distance with D is 31, B's distance with D is 34. So 31 plus 34 divided by 2, 32.5. Similarly, the distance with E can be A's distance with E that is 23, B's distance with E that is 21 divided by 2 that is 22. So now we have constructed a new matrix which is D2 with these new distances. Here instead of putting A and B separately we have put as AB and AB's distance with C that is this one. AB's distance with D 32.5 here. AB's distance with E that is 22 here. And similarly AB's distance with C, D and E here. So the same matrix has been reconstructed based on the new distances. Again, we'll repeat the same step. So, smallest or the shortest value we are having now here is 22. So, which is the distance with E? So, now we will join AB with the E here. So, AB with E here. Now, the distance of A with V or B with V or E with V will be the value that is 22 divided by 2 that is 11 but this is the distance from v to all these points what will be the distance between v and u for that the distance between u and v can be calculated the distance between e and v minus a and u or e and v minus b and u so we have 11 unit distance between e and v minus 8.5 which we calculated earlier the distance between a and u or b and u which has been denoted here. So this is how we keep on calculating the distance and the interrelationship between the taxons. You will keep on repeating these steps until you get a final tree from the initial data matrix distance matrix which is here you can have this kind of phylogenetic tree. So this is called as UPGMA method. Moving to the next method which is called as neighbor joining method. It is the latest agglomerative clustering method used for building phylogenetic trees. It is a phenetic method based on the distances again just like UPGMA developed by Naruya Setu and Mesotoshi Ne in 1987. It builds an unrooted phylogenetic tree and does not require ultrametric distances and uses the star decomposition method. It is much a rapid method and better results 
we obtain as compared to UPGMA. Now going by the steps, we first start with the distance matrix and a star like tree. So let's say this is a star like tree between A, B, C, D, E, F and G. Then group the two most similar taxa into a node and calculate the branch length. So here let's say F and G are most similar taxa. So we group them and let's say you chose the common ancestral or node point. So we calculate the distance from U to F and G. Recalculate the distance matrix, branch length and construct a new tree. So from B to C. Now similar to the previous examples, F and G were joined together by U and then let's say the next one is E which is having shortest distance. U and V have certain length in between and so on. So from A to B, C, D and finally you come to the E. That means you are repeating the process until only one terminal is present. So this is the neighbor joining methods which we use. Now what are the differences between UPGMA and neighbor joining method? UPGMA is a straightforward approach for constructing a rooted phylogenetic tree from a distance matrix whereas neighbor joining is more modern or new approach for phylogenetic tree construction which is unrooted through a star tree. Now besides people who have uh, developed it, UPGMA is an agglomerative hierarchical clustering methods based on average linkage method. Whereas neighbor joining is an iterative clustering method based on minimum evolution criteria. It builds a rooted tree in UPGMA whereas it builds an unrooted tree in a neighbor joining methods. It requires the distance to be ultrametric in UPGMA. The distance are to be addictive in case of neighbor joining. The UPGMA as it assumes equal rates of evolution, branch tips come out equal. Whereas in case of NG or neighbor joining, it allows unequal rates of evolution. The branch lengths are proportional to the amount of change. UPGMA is a simple and fast method but unreliable whereas neighbor joining is comparatively a rapid method and produces better results. Moving ahead to the next which is called as cladistics or character based method. In these we use the aligned sequences directly during the tree interface. So we do not develop a distance matrix we use align sequences directly using the tree interface. We use all known evolutionary information that is the individual substitutions among the sequences to determine the most likely ancestral relationship. Under the cluster based methods there are two approaches one is called as maximum parsimony and another one is called as maximum likelihood. Let's first discuss about the maximum parsimony, method, parsimony methods which involves the identification of tree topology that requires the smallest number of changes to explain the observed differences. That means the shortest pathway leading to these is chosen as the best tree. Simply under this criteria, the shortest possible tree that explains the data is considered the best. Means they are also called as minimal evolution method. It has been developed by James S. Forrest in 1970 and Walter M. Fish in 1971. This is best suited method for smaller and similar sequences, but it's less reliable as compared to maximum likelihood. Let us see how it works. The steps. For example, let's take there are four operational taxonomic units A, B, C and D here and there are nine different sites. A nucleotide site is informative only if it favors a subset of trees over the other possible trees. Now if you see there are some invariants. Invariance means if you focus on 1, on 6 and on 8, there is no change. So there, are, there is no variation and they are called as invariant sites. 
So besides uh, the invariant sites, we do not consider these invariant sites for the construction of tree. And besides them, there are some uninformative sites also which we do not consider. Let us see what do we mean by that. There are certain variable sites. Site 2 is uninformative. Remember, besides the invariant sites, we are not considering the uninformative sites also. Now you see site 2 is uninformative because all three possible tree requires one evolutionary change that is G to A. Now before we go ahead here, you can see here three uh, different trees has been shown. Four OTUs form these three possible unrooted trees 1, 2 and 3. Let's say if this is site 3, this one, that means A, B, C and D, which is shown here A, B, C and D. So in A, at this position G is there, in B it is C, in C it is A and in D it is A. So let's assume these are the ancestral groups from which this four changes or four groups have emerged. So this is one possible tree wherein A and B are on one side, that means A and B are grouped together in one and then C and D in another one. The other possibility is A and C are in this one clad or one group, B and D are in the other one. In the third one, A and D are together and B and C are here together. So in nomenclature kind of thing or understanding what we are showing here is this small alphabets A, B, C and D are representing OTUs. Capital letters A, G, C, A, T uh, represents the nucleotides at that uh, particular site and these at the middle, these are showing the ancestors from which the probability is that they have emerged. So these three possibilities of trees at three at different sites have been shown here. Now coming back to these variable sites, site 3 is also uninformative because all trees require two changes that you can see with the red lines here. Site 4 is uninformative because all three requires three changes. I have not shown here site 4 because it is just like site 3, it's just that there are three uh, changes required. Site 5 is informative because tree 1 requires only one change, whereas tree 2 and 3 requires two changes. Same is the case with site 9. Which is like just like 5. Site uh, 9 is informative because tree 2 requires one change and tree 1 and 3 require two changes. So if these kind of situations occur, these are called as informative uh, sites. Whereas if there are equal number of changes required, that is also called as uninformative uh, sites. We do not consider them. So we will consider site 5, 7 and 9 here in this example. A site is informative only when there are at least two different kinds of nucleotides at this site among the OTUs, each of which is represented in at least two OTUs. Identification of all informative sites and for each possible tree, the minimum number of substitution at each informative site is calculated as you can see here. In the examples for site 5, 7, 9, which I just mentioned as informative sites, tree 1 require 1, 1 and 2 changes, tree 2 requires 2, 2 and 1 changes and tree 3 require 2, 2 and 2 changes. So if you sum up them, tree 1 is chosen because it requires 4 changes and 2 and 3 require 5 and 6 changes. And as we mentioned initially, the minimum number of changes are uh, considered as the best possible way of constructing the tree. So tree 1 here will be chosen to construct the tree because it requires minimal number of changes. So this is how the maximum parsimony method is being used to construct the trees. Moving ahead with the next or the last method which is called as maximum likelihood that was originally developed by 
for statistics by Fisher in 1912 and then 22 for inferring phylogenies from sequence data it was introduced by Philip Steele in 1981. It's an explicit statistical model that uses all the data. It outperforms distance matrix and the parsimony methods because it is more accurate than all other methods but the only limitation is it is slow and thus it becomes impractical for large data sets. Now if you see by the steps involved let us assume that this is the multiple sequence alignment of globin genes from three different organisms. So what we do here is we create a probabilistic model. A model or hypothesis about how one ancestral sequence has evolved into three sequences that are present in this alignment. So how the ancestral globin has evolved into three different types here. And this probabilistic method parameters the simplest case if you see there can be tree topology and the branch lengths, nucleotide sequences and the nucleotide nucleotide substitution rates. So from these four nucleotides to these four nucleotides what is the probability of changing from A to A, probability from changing to A to C, A to G, A to T and so on. So this kind of matrix is there. <coughs> now computing the probability of one column in an alignment given tree topology and other parameters. Now let's assume column wise. We won't consider these invariant column. Let's first take this column which is having some changes. So column in alignment contains homologous nucleotides. Assume tree topology, branch lengths and other parameters are given. So now assume ancestral states were A and A. So A and A are the ancestral states here. Start computation at any internal or external nodes. Arrow indicates direction of computation here. So this is T which is present in this first. Then T, C and G. So probability is T to A, A to T, A to A, A to C or A to G. These kind of possibilities are there. So probability if you have to calculate in total. You need to calculate probability of T to A that is T1 here, probability of A key that is T2 here, probability of A to A which is T3, T4 and T5 and so on. Then you compute the probability of an entire alignment given, given the tree topology and other parameters. So we just consider this one uh, column. And we consider only A and A ancestral form. There can be other ancestral possibilities also. So we have two internodes giving almost 16 possible combinations. Probability of individual columns are multiplied to given the all prob overall probability of the alignment. And then we take the log of it because in a computational methods there can be errors because of very small numbers because multiplication of large number of probability terms may lead to underflow. This is computational uh, uh, methods of underflowing to avoid that we use take the log number of this and we take the sum total of the log number of all these probabilities to compute the probability overall probabilities. So if you had A to A as the common ancestor then there are 16 possibilities A to C, A, G, A, T and so on and this is the likelihood that you have calculated overall likelihood and this is the sum total of that. So similar ways you choose random initial values for all parameters, compute likelihood, change parameters slightly in a direction so that likelihood improves. So you keep on changing slightly so that with an intention that likelihood has to improve and you repeat until maximum is found. The results is maximum likelihood estimate of tree topology, maximum likelihood estimate of branch length, maximum likelihood estimate of other model parameters and then measure of how well model fits the data. So the initial model which you took, you calculate 
the probabilities you try to predict the maximum likelihood based on different parameters and then you predict which model fits the best or which is the having maximum likelihood to fit the data which is you are having now so if you compare maximum parsimony with the maximum likelihood in maximum parsimony the technique is to draw a phylogenetic tree with minimal number of character state changes whereas maximum likelihood is a technique of drawing a phylogenetic tree with maximum likelihood between the genetic data the characters which are considered in me are low whereas in ml it is high the branches are longer in parsimony and likelihood has short trees with short branches in terms of reliability maximum likelihood is highly reliable as compared to maximum parsimony method now if you see an overall comparative uh, view of distance methods and maximum parsimony and likelihood methods distance based methods are very fast but maximum parsimony is a bit slower and maximum likelihood is slowest but it gives good results for small data sets and for testing trees built using other methods so you need to decide which method you are going to use depending on the length of the sequences how much data sets you have and all other parameters the best part is you need not to do it manually all the sequences and it is not feasible also to do all these phylogenetic tree construction manually so for that softwares have been developed programs have been created for example there is a program which is called as paup which is called as phylogenetic analysis using parsimony so pop methods can be used for construction of phylogenetic trees similarly there are methods or the programs called as phylep which is phylogeny inference package so using phylep you can decide whether you are going to use distance neighbor joining or uh, maximum likelihood or parsimony and you can create your phylogenetic trees similarly is the program which is called as mega that is molecular evolutionary genetics analysis so you can use these programs to create the phylogenetic trees and you can decide the method you are going to use tree puzzle is another program that can be widely used for construction of trees now another important thing is the evaluation of phylogenetic trees once you have got the trees you need to evaluate for that there is something called as bootstrap value bootstrapping is a resampling analysis from the existing sample with replacement rebuilding the tree and then testing if the same nodes are recovered so it indicates let's say out of 100 times if you repeat the same branches observed when repeating the phylogenetic uh, tree construction on a resampled set of your data if we bootstrap 100 times that means if we take 100 applicates and let's say 95 times we get the same results then our bootstrap support for that particular result is 95 percent please remember the bootstrap does not is not a measure of the correctness of the tree it is simply the measure of the robustness of the underlying data and the tree if you see these kind of values they represent the bootstrap values so if you have a bootstrap 100 that means the bootstrap supports for this particular result 100 percent and depending on the values you can predict the robustness of your data the final step in tree construction is the presentation and interpretation now presentation we can uh, see whether it is a rooted tree or unrooted tree we can label the tree whether it is uh, how many internodes are there how many otus are there and so on we can decide the monophyletic paraphyletic and polyphyletic groups we can see the bootstrap values how robust is that and so on then the question comes we have created the trees but what are the uses of such tree so uses of phylogenetic trees can be in different branches various uses can be there for example in taxonomy 
or the classification studies or when you are predicting the relatedness of the species or organisms, the phylogenetic trees are very helpful. You can also predict the evolutionary relationships between the organisms or species using the phylogenetic tree based on the molecular sequences. You can identify the origin of pathogens. For example, let's say if a new pathogen comes, we do not know where it is coming from, what is its origin. So in that case, phylogenetic tree are quite helpful. You can predict its ancestor, its phylogenetic history based on the phylogenetic tree. Also, in various conservation studies, the phylogenetic trees are very helpful. But besides these beneficial roles phylogenetic trees uh, provide us with, there are certain limitations as well. They are hypothesis based on the data used to construct them. Not necessarily accurate in terms of evolutionary history. Remember, in the initial points only, we said these are the hypothesis based. We do not know exactly what has happened, but these are most correct hypotheses that we can predict based on the molecular sequences. The data that we use to construct the trees, they might be noisy at times. There can be a bag, can be errors. Unless otherwise indicated, length of the branch does not mean the time passed, but only the evolutionary order. Also, there can be a DNA degradation for which you have taken the sequences. There can be recombination DNA transfers also, which you are not going to know based on the molecular sequences only. So these kind of uh, problems can be there when you are taking the sequences for construction of phylogenetic trees and you are relying on those trees. Let's move to the summary part of what we discussed in today's lecture. We discussed about phylogenetic trees. We discussed about various types of phylogenetic trees, the like dendrogram, chronogram, cladogram, phylogram, and so on. We saw what are the terms that we used to interpret the trees, and then the steps involved in the construction of phylogenetic tree. We discussed about distance-based tree, under which we see how we construct UPGMA-based tree, how neighbor joining constructs a tree, how character-based trees are being made based on maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood. We saw various programs which are being used for construction of trees, evaluation using bootstrap values, interpretation of trees and finally we talked briefly about various uses and limitations of phylogenetic trees. Now for further uh, studies or refinement of your understanding you can refer these many books based on the phylogenetic tree with things. Uh, I would like to thank you. Happy learning.